Hi, I'm Iris. I'm a scientist by training, and I'm a senior project manager at Long Live the Kings. And what that means is that in my day to day, I get to work with groups of scientists from around the region on projects that help support salmon and steelhead and a healthy Puget Sound ecosystem. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about one of my projects, the Hood Canal Bridge Ecosystem Impact Assessment. So I'll just share these slides here. There we go. And what the results of this project are showing us about the effects of the Hood Canal Bridge on outmigrating juvenile steelhead. So first, let's talk about the bridge. If you live in the Puget Sound region, you've probably driven over this bridge at some point. It's right at the mouth of the canal, connecting the Kitsap Peninsula to the Olympic Peninsula, and it's the longest saltwater floating bridge in the world. How does it float and why? Well, lots of bridges have support columns that hold the bridge deck up, but Hood Canal is really, really deep at this point, over 300 feet deep in some parts of the, of the canal, and due to wind, current, and tidal action, it's a very dynamic environment. So, when this bridge was designed and constructed in the late 1950s, engineers decided to create these giant concrete pontoons filled with air and attached to the seafloor by a network of anchor cables. These pontoons are what help keep the bridge afloat, and they span about 83% of the width of Hood Canal, extending 15 feet down from the surface into the water column. This bridge is really a marvel of modern engineering, but what we're finding now is that it's also a barrier for small fish as they outmigrate to the ocean. The bridge has these open side spans, and those were designed with fish passage in mind based on our current knowledge at the time, which was that juvenile salmon and steel had hugged the shoreline as they outmigrate. Nowadays, we're finding that that's not really the case. And so really, no one knew how much the bridge was impacting steelhead until our partners at NOAA discovered a surprising pattern in one of their steelhead survival data sets. And that's where our story begins. Based on that initial pattern, Long Live the Kings and NOAA formed a team of researchers to investigate further to figure out what's happening to steelhead at the bridge and what we can do about it. So in phase one of this project, we did two years of intensive field work, conducting fish and predator surveys, measuring water quality, traffic noise, and bridge lighting, and of course, trying to see the bridge through the eyes of a six inch long juvenile steelhead. Now, how do we do that? Well, we tag them. And when I say tag, I mean that really literally. We actually take wild juvenile steelhead that are ready to migrate into Hood Canal. We anesthetize them and then we surgically implant a tiny tag into their stomach cavity. These tags each emit, or ping, a unique code, and we have lines of acoustic receivers deployed at strategic locations in Hood Canal and around the bridge, as well as further out into Puget Sound, so that as each individual tagged fish passes over a receiver line, the tag within the fish is pinging, and the receiver can hear and record that unique code. We can't exactly see what the fish see, uh, but we can track their movements and understand their experience in that way. Megan Moore at NOAA's Manchester Lab does all of the tagging work for this project, and she's partnered with Long Live the Kings on several other tagging projects around Puget Sound. So when you're done watching this, go check out her video on the Nisqually Estuary for more sweet steelhead science. Here's a map of where we deployed receiver lines. So each little black dot on that map is a receiver. You can see on the inset maps that at the bridge, we actually had not just a single line, but an array of receivers. These receiver locations were arranged very precisely such that we could triangulate the position of each tagged fish in the vicinity. And that means that we could look at the exact migration route that each fish took approaching the bridge and which of those routes were successful and which were not. The first thing that we found is that about half of our steelhead that make it to the bridge, uh, so that's this little segment here, half of them die there. That's really high mortality to see in just one spot. And to put it in perspective, looking at a different system, the juvenile steelhead mortality through uh, all eight Snake and Lower Columbia River dams is also about 50%. So eight dams, one bridge, it's an issue. We also found that the bridge slowed down migration. So here's the bridge, and the fish get to the bridge. It takes on average one to two days for them to figure out how to navigate past it and continue to the ocean. Now, a couple days doesn't sound like all that long, but keep in mind that the full migration all the way from river mouth to ocean is only about two weeks. So this is a pretty big chunk of time for little fish to be spending in one spot. 
Those fish that do successfully cross the bridge do it by either going through the open side stands or actually by diving underneath the pontoons. And they'll cross during both day and night, but we found that they pretty much only cross on ebbing currents. So each of these little dots represents a successful fish crossing the bridge. And I've placed a line here at slack, zero current velocity, just for your reference. You'll see that most of these successful crossings are happening at higher current velocities and almost all are on the ebb current as the water is rushing out of Hood Canal and towards the ocean. As we look deeper into the tagging data, we begin to notice patterns in the locations and movements of surviving fish versus mortalities. There were these high densities of survivors that aggregated near these corners formed by cross pontoons that stick out perpendicularly from the bridge structure, the center draw span, and then the open side spans. The non-survivors, you see uh, maybe a similar aggregation near pontoon corners, but you're also seeing much more uniform high density distributed along the south side of the bridge. This next slide is going to show you why that pattern appears. So here we have two animations. I'm going to start them one at a time so that you can take the time to see the first one before we move to the second. And this animation on the left shows two days of typical survivor movement. So these are fish that we know got to the bridge, survived past the bridge, and got detected on a later receiver line in Admiralty Inlet or Juan de Fica. There's a little bit of delay when they get to the bridge, but then eventually they figure it out or they get lucky and they get through. Again, either finding an open side scan and going around or diving underneath on an ebb current. Now contrast that with the second animation on the right. And this is showing two weeks, not two days, but two weeks of non-survivor movement. You'll start to see these long back and forth track lines. And we're pretty confident that this is not a fish behavior. This is a predator behavior. So a predator that's eaten a steelhead, the tag is transmitting now from within the predator's belly as it does this sort of back and forth patrolling behavior up and down the bridge infrastructure. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the predator behavior that tells us a little bit about who these predators might be. So first, we know that whatever predator is eating steelhead, many of them are deep divers. A subset of the acoustic tags that we deployed were depth sensitive, so we could tell where the tag was positioned within the water column. This top panel shows you a typical steelhead migration pattern. So the fish is very, very surface oriented. It's in the top meter of the water column until it gets to the bridge. And then you see a little dive as this one goes under the bridge and then comes right back up to the surface. That's a successful surviving steelhead that crossed the bridge. This middle panel looks a little different. And this is a mortality. Uh, so it's got typical steelhead behavior, happy little steelhead swimming along at the surface until it gets to the bridge. And then all of a sudden the tag starts making these deep dives up and down to 40 or more meters. Up to 85% of the mortalities that we observed in these depth sensitive tags showed this kind of behavior and every single tag that showed this behavior then became stationary afterwards. So again, the predator ate the steelhead, the tag started showing the predator's movement, and then the predator later excreted the tag. And as you see in this bottom panel, uh, the tag after excretion uh, was then stationary on the seafloor, showing just this natural tidal pattern variation in depth for the rest of the duration of its battery life. We also know that some of these predators eating steelhead are warm-blooded. So in the second year of research, we deployed temperature-sensitive tags, and 69% of the mortalities that we observed with those tags showed this pattern where as the fish approached the bridge, you saw this cool ambient water temperature. That's exactly what you would expect from a tag within a steelhead, a, a poikilothermic, a cold-blooded fish, uh, followed by a rapid ramp up when the fish got eaten, and then a cool down later when the tag was excreted. And again, every tag that showed this pattern, every tag that got warm became stationary afterwards. We can use this information the changes and the timing of the changes in dive pattern and temperature to pinpoint the actual locations of predation. So not where the tag was excreted, but where the fish was actually caught and eaten by the predator. And doing so, we found that predators ate fish along the length of the bridge, mostly during daylight hours. There are many potential predators near the Hood Canal Bridge, including several different bird species some of which, like pigeon guillemots, do appear to be using the bridge as an artificial shoreline. 
And of course, there are also several species of marine mammals, harbor seals, sea lions, harbor porpoises. Our partners at the Port Gamble Squalum Tribe have completed observational surveys along the bridge infrastructure and the immediate surrounding areas, and they've confirmed that during the steelhead out migration season, that April to June period, predators are pretty much always at the bridge. The only surveys where they didn't see predators were associated with strong winds and choppy waves, uh, and those conditions also limit the ability of the observers to detect predator presence. Predators didn't appear to be deterred by bridge noise or boat traffic. Port Gamble Squalum Tribe also deployed acoustic and video equipment on the bridge infrastructure and also looking into surrounding waters. And these, uh, these surveys observed seals exhibiting both foraging and transiting behavior in all areas. And the plot that's shown here of seal presence over a 24 hour period doesn't yet include results from the 2019 deployment that's pictured up in the corner pontoon, but our preliminary data analysis suggests similar or just slightly higher seal activity in that area. So you might have guessed, um, I buried the lead a little bit there, uh, but we're fairly confident that these data are pointing us towards seal predation as a major factor for juvenile steelhead at the bridge. That's consistent with the dive patterns and temperature data from our tagging data set. The literature re review of predator diets completed by our partners at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the near bridge observations from our partners at Port Gamble Squalum Tribe. The other predator species in this vicinity aren't likely a major cause of steelhead mortality, although some of them may be impacting smaller salmon species. We're now taking the results of these two years of intensive research and we're transitioning into phase two of this project. And in phase two, we will be designing and implementing solutions, again, along with our partners, uh, that facilitate fish passage and discourage predation at the bridge. And once those solutions are in place, we and our partners, of course, will be monitoring to make sure that they're actually working to improve juvenile steelhead survival and get more of our fish successfully out to the ocean. I want to end with this fun little video clip taken by our partners at the Port Gamble Slalom Tribe. This footage is from a GoPro camera deployed right at the bridge. And like I mentioned, Port Gamble Slalom Tribe conducted, conducted extensive on-bridge surveys throughout phase one of this project. Their observations suggest there are hundreds of juvenile Chinook and thousands of chum, you see them in this video, in close proximity to the bridge that are displaying behavior that's more typical of a shoreline environment. So we think that the bridge might not only be impacting steelhead, but also these other salmon species. And as we move forward into phase two, while we test ways to improve steelhead passage and survival, we will continue supporting these efforts to understand potential bridge impacts to other species as well. The Hood Canal Bridge Ecosystem Impact Assessment is a big project. I only had time to touch on a portion of it today, so if you have questions or want to know more about the other research going on at the bridge, don't hesitate to reach out and ask. Thanks again to all of our partners listed here, and thank you all so much for tuning in today.